Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Sex Addiction in the News on Facebook Live, Fridays at 5. I am Stacy Sprout, licensed therapist, certified sex addiction therapist, and author of my own story of recovery called Naked in Public, a memoir of recovery from sex addiction and other temporary insanities. I created this show because I am passionate about destigmatizing sex addiction so those who are afflicted, women and men, people of all genders, whether that's individuals or families or partners who are affected by the disease, can get help now. I have two co-anchors with me here today. Oops, one of them just got off my lap, so it's just Sparky here. <laughs> and I have a very special guest to introduce you to. And before I do, I want to make a mention of a friend of mine who has a wonderful accomplishment that I want to share. And that is Forrest Benedict. He is an author, a therapist, and a designer of many educational materials for sex addiction recovery. He published a book called Life After Lust, and his book is now out on audiobook. So way to go, Forrest. We're very excited for you. Congratulations. And um, one other thing I'll say is the news has gone pretty crazy in the past week about sex addiction. Jada Pinkett Smith, compulsive sexual behavior disorder. We are going to be talking about that on the show, but without further ado, welcome. Thank you for being here, and I want to introduce you to Darren Ford. Darren, you and I met at the ITAP Symposium this year, and... <laughs> I happened to walk into this room full of, I don't know, how many therapists were in that room, would you say? At least, what, 800, 900? <laughs> there was a lot of people there. Lot, yeah. And as chance would have it, uh, Darren is a front seater, and I <laughs> happen to be a front seater myself. So I went up to the front of the room, and I sat down, and here was this really cool guy that I happened to sit next to. And I'm a little nervous sometimes in big crowds, and... Uh, it was really comforting to sit next to you and just feel like, ah, oh, this person is calm. I, I had that sense, like there's something about him that's calming to me. And so we struck up a conversation and in that I was moved to ask you to be on my show. And you are a very busy man with a full schedule and this was the earliest opportunity. So I'm so excited to have you here on the show. And I wonder if you could take a moment and tell us more about yourself and how, how did you get here? How did you get into to what you're doing? Cool. Certainly. The first thing I'd like to say is just thank you for, for letting me be on the show and, and having me as a guest. I'm very grateful. Um, you know, I, I tell clients that I see and, um, you know, that I come by my job very honestly. Of course, yes, I have the academic degree and all of that stuff, but you know, I am in the field of recovery because I live the field of recovery. I'm in recovery myself, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, it was quite a journey to to get myself into recovery. I took several tries. It took um, several different ways, and. I can remember when I was much younger and I was, you know, at the Gay and Lesbian Center as, as 19 years old and seeing a therapist myself and she asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to sit in your seat. She said, we'll go do it. Oh, you and knew. So I, I did that, but little did I realize in that process that uh, I would come have to come to terms with my own addiction and that I would have to overcome that and as I learned to reach out for help I felt frustrated at that time this was 20 years ago um, at the help that was offered because it wasn't it was, it was substandard I mean even the best help was substandard and we didn't really have a good idea and so as I about you know how to treat addiction so as I went through that process I realized that I had something to say for the recovery world and the treatment world and so I opened my own center and with, well, I opened, I partnered with Christy Cosper for the Sano Center for Recovery. Mm -hmm. And then I- Where is Sano located? Uh, Sano Center for Recovery has three locations. Okay. One in Newport Beach, one in West Los Angeles, and one in Long Beach, California. 
We offer uh, intensive outpatient as well as standard outpatient treatment. Um, it's all wrapped in a mindfulness-based uh, addiction therapeutic treatment modality, mm -hmm. big word, but, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we also employ a wraparound treatment model. So we don't just treat the addict, we treat the entire family. We have mm -hmm. specialists that work with partners, with the kids if needed, um, and we also do online uh, recovery coaching services. Wow. So, yeah, so. Cool. Well, I'm going to ask you more about that. <laughs> sure. I want to know more, um, but let me ask you this one first. So how would you say your treatment is different? Yeah, I think, you know, that it goes back to right, having something to say to the treatment community. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first things that I would present that, uh, that distinct, that makes our treatment model different from the rest is that we don't, I mean, yes, addiction is a, is a disease, don't get me wrong. But we frame it as a habit, a well-honed habit that can be practiced over a person's lifetime. You know, if you think about it, if you practice the habit of noticing, um, I don't know, the color blue your whole life, then no matter where you go, that's going to be the first thing that your mind attunes to. Mm -hmm. and right, when, when I say mind, you know, I, I want to say that we look at mind as a sense organ. So just like your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth. Um, and your skin, the mind is the organizing and coordinating sense organ. It takes in the data from all of the other sense organs, co co collates it into, uh, uh, into an idea, bounces that idea off of your past memories, and then spits out a hypothesis about the future. The problem is, is that hypothesis for addicts, we hold that hypothesis as true and real without questioning it. And we hold on to it, and then we behave it out. And that's where where the trouble comes into, because the hypothesis, more often than not, it, for for those of us who struggle with addiction, is not correct. It's just not correct. And you know, so in other words, the hypothesis is, hey, let's go abuse, let's mm -hmm. go act out sexually, mm -hmm. right? I need to I need to act out sexually. I need to hook up, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are those hypotheses. We grab onto them and we behave them. And we don't stop and and pause and think about wait a minute you know what what's the real outcome of this behavior and in fact not only do we not do that we we don't know how to do that when we're in our active addiction before treatment mm -hmm. and so the treatment model that we utilize is creates a process that allows you to see the mind right and not just act on the mind and that's a, a, a process that's incredibly difficult to do and it takes time and practice and that's why i often call recovery a process it's not a state it's a process that's ongoing just like addiction is a process that was ongoing mm -hmm. in your life mm -hmm. for years mm -hmm. yeah makes sense it, it addiction didn't i mean it developed over time and for most people's stories they were at this level and they added this and added this and the the escalation and so the, why wouldn't the recovery process and the mind healing also have its levels. They're absolutely. Going back it's, it's yeah. Absolutely. The, you know, the same process. And in fact, I tell clients oftentimes that the fact that they are an addict is proof that they can recover <gasps> because, you know, the I fact that. that they use their focus of their mind oh. to hone addiction so well <sighs> is proof that they can use that same focus to hone their recovery process that is so in the same good. fashion. You know, so we just take the skill that they already have, that focus of the mind, and we move it. And we just move it over here to hone in and focus on the healthy processes. That's why many, most addicts are very successful people, you know, because they've, they've taken that skill of focus and applied it in healthy ways in, their other, in other aspects of their life. I just want to... I mean, I don't know if you can tell, I'm really moved by that quote that you said. <laughs> so I want to just try to metabolize it a little bit more. I'm sure I'm going to be repeating it for the rest of my life in my work and probably in my brain. <laughs> um, so it's, and I, I can see it on like a Canva, you know, boom, I want to get it out in social media, your quote, which is the fact that you have an addiction is proof that you can recover. Is that, yeah, I mean, it is that is so disarming of the shame and i think the focus on the the mind and how the mind 
works and, and moving into your mind actually works. It's just focused on something that is now causing you pain. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the thing, right? There's so much, so many of us come into recovery feeling broken, mm -hmm. but actually, and you know, Carl Jung, I believe, I hope this is accurate, was the first person to kind of argue that there is no such thing as a mental health disorder. There's only natural reactions to incredibly unnatural situations to kind I of that. You know, surmise it. Mm -hmm. And and we we hold that idea in the approach here at, at Sonic Center for Recovery is that we, you know, look at what the client's going through as a natural reaction to traumatic traumatic situations mm -hmm. and motor more often than not that trauma uh came on board before the brain was completely developed so their emotional brain which is the evolutionary oldest part of the brain it represents the youngest part of the self right it's the most developed at birth so how does the baby know it exists it knows it exists because not because it sees itself as separate from the parent, but just because it feels the ambient emotional energy from the parent. Mm -hmm. So that part of the child is mostly developed, and as the, the traumatic environment happens, they get flooded with the emotions, but the human brain isn't developed enough to deal with those emotions. So, you know, it, it fractures off from them. And yeah. of course, the next part of the brain to develop, right, is the impulse center or the default mode network. Right. And so that's the impulse center, and that's what, what they start behaving in. What is addiction? It's an intimacy and impulse disorder. And that's where the person gets stuck. And then the final part, that prefrontal cortex, which is right here, is the youngest evolutionary part of the brain, but it represents the oldest part of self. Mm -hmm. That's the part of the brain, right? That this part right here, that's the part of the brain that's, that hasn't had the opportunity to create those neuro, neurological connections with the emotional part of the brain. And so when you start to practice a mindful approach, what you're actually doing, and, and Richie Davis and John kabat and Daniel Segal have done a lot of research on this, so what you're starting to do is create neural connections between those parts of the brain, and that's the recovery process. And Thank goodness with the body, if you don't use it, you lose it. So as we construct those neural pathways with our focus, we move our focus away from the addictive pathways, and those addictive pathways start to be deconstructed, and they start to go away. They never totally go away, but they mostly go away. That's interesting. I, I you know, the, the title, thank you for sharing that. So that's a wonderful and succinct explanation to brain health and how brain development correlates to addiction and, and thus to recovery. Uh, I, in the title of my book, I say sex addiction. Uh Oh, I think my husband's coming home and then my dog's going to do his guard dog thing. And the sun is like beaming in here. So woo live. <laughs> it's okay. Rocky I might have to go get him and comfort him anyway. Um, it's okay. <laughs> um, um, losing my train of thought here. Oh, the title of my book is um, "Sex Addiction and Other Temporary Insanities." And right. often, when I share the title of that, people say, "Wait a minute, what do you mean temporary?" You know, and so, but and and I've asked people about that um, in various positions, and what what do they think about the concept? And and there's there's often the caveat, like it doesn't go away. Um, but I appreciate use it or lose it, fire together, wire together. You know, we go in a different direction and that gets more and more and more and more powerful. And then you have this, sometimes I compare it to like a super hot, you have a new super highway and that's just an old kind of trail, you know, right. and you just don't go down there anymore. It's like, no, it's not, it doesn't, doesn't hit me as addiction at this time. I'm not suffering from that. Um, those, those quali qualities. Um, so, okay. So, but. I wanted to ask you this, what is the difference between sobriety and recovery? Because you make that distinction in your work. Yeah, so, you know, and I think that this is an important distinction. You know, any, anybody can get sobriety in a lockdown unit. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if you go to an inpatient center, mm -hmm. and even if you, you know, and you get, you get locked in a, in a space where you're contained, where you can't get out, you're going to get sobriety. Right? If you're on heroin, you're going to go through withdrawals and you're going to get sobriety. If you're a sex addict, you're going to go through your withdrawals, you're going to get sobriety. Then you're going to be released and you're going to come out into your life where the triggers are, 
where the relapse potential is, and learning how to live your life with those triggers and have a different response rather than an addictive response, that's recovery. Mm -hmm. And the mistake that I think I see those of us who are struggling with addiction make is that we mistake sobriety for recovery. So the client comes in for treatment, they're like, hey, I'm good, I got this, because I'm sober. Like, I'm good to go, thanks, I'll see you later. It's like, whoa, wait a minute, no, 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 no. There's still a very long process of rehabituating or learning your new healthy patterns. You know, and what, what I always tell people is the mind, it does what it knows. So left to its own devices, without a long time of in the recovery world, it's just going to slowly go back to the way it used to be mm. because that's right. That's mm. uh, neurologically what's happening. And that's what we do. We do what we know, mm. right? Because we're more comfortable. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a very famous Buddhist saying, if it's in the way, it is the way. Mm. And that's very much right. The reality is that we have to move closer to the emotional discomfort. And that's really the first stage in, re in re the recovery process, right, is teaching people how to feel again. Mm -hmm. right? How many people come in and say to a therapist, I want you to teach me how not to feel. And how long you came to the wrong place and then you do exactly the opposite. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it reminds me of, I used to work in a nursing home and um, a rehab center. And one of the things they would teach people is who had had hip replacements is not, uh, they would, they would teach them how not to fall, but they would also teach them how to fall. Absolutely. And so yes. yeah, how, how recovery is encompasses so much more than just sobriety and how we respond to the challenges in our life. And, and I think of flourishing. I really think of when I think of recovery, I think of, are you flourishing? You know, so I, I think of myself and I can be such a perfectionist. It's like, I, you know, rigid and hold tight. And, but when I do that, I'm not flourishing. I'm not kind of enjoying the mess of life and the, the beauty. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I think about where my life is now in comparison to where it was in my addiction. And I think, thank God, you know, if I hadn't learned how to be in recovery, I wouldn't have the life I have now. I wouldn't, you know, and, and what I mean by that is even if I, what, if I had never, struggled with addiction, I don't think I would have the life I have now because I've gained so much from those struggles, right? And once I, thank goodness, I made it out the other end, I came close not to. I mean, at one point I woke up, you know, in an ICU unit, and that's really when I said, you know, this is not working. Mm -hmm. I need something different. And, um, and so when I, you know, but thank God I made it, and once I made it through that, then it's like, okay, now got to figure out how to love myself and that's really what recovery is it's learning how to love yourself mm, that's beautiful and that story of you know the juxtaposition between the unmanageability landing you in the icu right and and today saying if it weren't for all of that i wouldn't be here and i yeah, relate to yeah, that you know yeah don't want to do it again <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't want to do it again. We don't have to because of recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to say that we got a lovely comment. So we have some folks who are watching with us and we have a lovely comment from our friend and colleague, Mari Lee. Love that oh, the focus is on mindfulness. Oh, do you love Mari? Yes, she's amazing. What do you love about her? Let's take a moment. You know, one of the greatest lessons I learned from Mari is to notice notice the beauty in people you know i would come in i would sit down oftentimes with her and i would be talking about how i'm sad and angry because this person's this and this person's not doing this just in my in my overall desire to grow you know the recovery center and kind of do these things and she often you know she's my coach she's oh. you know and and she would always talk about the accomplishments of you know, and how she's seen accomplishments in people and, and, and offer them praise even in the discomfort. And it, she never, you know, what I love about Mari, she never says, now, now, you need to stop doing this and you need to do this. She doesn't do that. Instead, she lives the example. Aww. And you know what I mean? And that is just deeply to me, deeply moving because.
because that that's where my that's where I gain the lesson mm-hmm. versus somebody just telling me telling me you need to do this. Instead, she just she lives it. She exudes it for who she is. And mm-hmm. I, I just completely grateful. For, for her wisdom. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. I thank you for being here. Um, and I believe that you are doing that. You're doing that now. You you did it for me when I sat next to you and I was kind of nervous. It was like you were just exuding this this calm and peace. And um, so you are an author and I'm sitting in the wrong place because I want viewers to be able to see your book is next to oh, you. And yeah. I, could you tell us about the title of your book and what it's about? Sure. So, you know, the title of the book is Transforming the Addicted Mind, and it's a workbook. And it's a workbook that uh, uses different uh, tools to help you start to gain awareness of how to relate to your addicted mind in a different way. Mm-hmm. You know, clients come in and they their relationship to their addicted mind is one of aggression and, and oftentimes hatred. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is not productive to recovery. You know, I, oh, well, what's that? Um, oh, sorry, we were technical glitch. I think it's oh, okay. random. Um, so, you know, I think it, what we have to do, I love, and it, there's a quote in the book that says, um, once I know my enemy, once I know him well enough to, to love him, him, or once I know him well enough to defeat him, I then love him because I realize I am him. And, you know, that, that is the crux of it, right? Is that we have to learn how to take that part of ourself, that addict part of ourself, that addict mind, and move it into a relationship with ourselves that's loving, that's compassionate, that's connected, and that's nurturing. And when I use that word nurturing, people all the time, whether it's a recovery, uh, somebody in recovery, whether it's a therapist, go, what are you talking about? Nurture it. That means you want it to flourish. Uh. Yes, you do want it to flourish in a healthy way, right? And the only way we can do that is to move closer to it and to transform the way we relate to it. So, you know, if I was going to use a, a title more more succinctly, it would be transforming the way we relate to, or not succinctly, but longer, Mm -hmm. uh, would be transforming the way we relate to the addicted mind. But since that's so long, transforming the addicted mind. (laughs) Well, the idea is is to get to know it. And it's a hard process to do that because to get to know it means we have to allow ourselves to feel the discomfort that arises around it as we Mm -hmm. move closer to it. Mm Ultimately, it's a different way of just saying we have to become intimate with ourselves, Mm -hmm. right? People say, oh, what is meditation? Meditation is, you know, cultivating intimacy with the self. That's Mm -hmm. all it is, right? Right? You move closer to yourself. And when you do that, when you learn how to bear witness to your own struggle, right, then you're able to be present and bear witness to other people's struggles, right? And that's also where we came up with the name uh, for Sano. Sano we got from the old Latin, uh, a modern day Spanish, it means help, but the old Latin, it means to bear witness to another's suffering or to be present with one in their hour of need. Mm-hmm. And that's really where we got that name. And that's that's our whole kind of shtick. That's, that's the way it is, right? We, our job is to teach people how to bear witness to their own struggle and be present with that discomfort and then do that in their lives to the people around them. That is beautiful. Yeah, it's it's so encouraging. You know, I think of the old model of addiction treatment as, you know, confrontational and shaming. And yeah, okay, we talk about containment and not hurting others. But but boy, and, and, you know, it's interesting, Darren, because lately I've been talking with a lot of therapists and heal, healers in this area and practitioners and coaches. And one thing I've noticed is people who have been at this a while, they come back to a very similar theme of love, nurture, compassion. It's, it's pretty, it's, yeah, it's a pretty constant. And so I appreciate how you're holding that space and talking about that as well with the people that you work with and, and yourself. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, that old way of like confrontation, you know, if that, 
if that worked, there wouldn't be addicts because addicts are the more brutal in themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Addicts think taking responsibility means sitting down on the couch and whipping yourself, you know, and shaming yourself. And if that worked, you know, they're, they're experts at it, right? And I always tell clients that that doesn't do anything for you. That's not taking responsibility. That's just injuring yourself more and leaving a mess, a bloody mess on the couch, you know? That's not going to work. Taking responsibility is where it's at there. And taking responsibility really means taking that deep breath, accepting the, the pain and the suffering that you've caused, and turning to the people that love you and say, I'm sorry, I don't know how I'm going to change this. What I do know is I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I never do this again. And then they reach out for help. And the surest sign that you know how to take care of yourself is your ability to ask for help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that message of people in recovery, when they don't, they don't have it figured out of how they're going to turn things around, but they're determined to do that. That is a very encouraging message for partners and just hearing you model that. I mean, it's kind of funny, but you can't see this, but off camera, my dog just totally stretched out. He's like, ah, you know? <laughs> I think he's responding to your tone of voice as you say that it's just, um, you know, it's the, it's the one who's been irresponsible taking responsibility. You know, it's that transformation right. of coming out of the chaos and into some kind of new focus of of healing and amends and so um i you're kind of tying into what someone might say to their partner you mentioned earlier that you work with partners and families um how why is that important why should they be in treatment too Uh, you know what that is a wonderful question and you know we have to think about everything in terms of systems right Mm -hmm. and so you know, if you think about a marriage, and let's say it's like this, and this is the way it was when the addiction was present in the marriage, then the addict comes in and they start to do this and start to move into recovery. Well, the partner is still over here, right? And so we have to start to allow the partner to, to move towards that same new way of relating. And, you know, that is hard. Humans shift shifting human belief patterns or thought patterns is difficult. And what we know, what the studies have shown is that relapse decreases when all members Mm -hmm. of the family are in treatment. Mm -hmm. So just based off of that, that's an argument. But if we even move all of that aside and just a more practical way, a partner woke up to the, to a person that they didn't know. Right after after discovery, mm-hmm. they woke up mm-hmm. and they thought that they had been with this person for 10, 15, 20 years that they knew, and all of a sudden they turn around and they're like, I don't even know who this is. And because I believed this person was somebody, and now I don't know who they are and I can't trust them, can I even trust myself? Like mm-hmm. how how do I even know what I'm thinking about anything is accurate? So that they start to unfold into this, into this um, area of self question and mistrust and, you know, and, and rightfully so because they're in trauma and could they get through that on their own? Maybe they could, however, they shouldn't have to. Right. And so they, they should come in and work through that trauma. And then the other reason why is there's something that's called first order change and there's something called second order change, right? First order change, a person's married to let's just use uh, we'll just say a sex addict, right? And they find out that they're sex that their partner's a sex addict, and they say, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm not dealing with this. They leave the sex addict, mm-hmm. and they go and they're single for a few years, and they go marry somebody new. And guess what? That new person, most likely, according to the research, is going to be sex an addict, addict of some sort, or an addict of some kind. Okay. That's, yeah. yeah. That's okay. first order change. Right. So you left Second. the person, but you didn't necessarily fix your picker or. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Correct. Right. Absolutely. Right. And that second order change is whether or not you continue in the, in the relationship, mm-hmm. you go into treatment and you find out what is it about my life and my, ex- my relationship to life that allowed me to pick somebody who was struggling with addiction. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can remember uh, when I, Again, back when I was like 19, 20 years old, and you know, I was 
I was going to the clubs as a, as a young gay man in Hollywood and trying to find myself. And at that time, you know, I was basically living on my own, homeless, sleeping like from couch to couch. And my biggest priority was going to a club, right? And going to my therapist. Those were my, and going to school. Those were my three, three main motives in life. And, um, the therapist told me, Darren, you know, when you look across that nightclub and you see a person there that you think, wow, that's that's the one, that's the one I want to get to know. She said, I want you to take your hand and move it directly to the right. And the person that's behind that person that you hardly notice at all that you think you're not interested in, <laughs> that's the person that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me decades to understand that. And it was because because of my own traumas, mm -hmm. they clouded my ability mm -hmm. to see the qualities that I truly needed for myself. Mm -hmm. right? And it was only through a process of a long process of treatment and recovery that I could learn how to identify and articulate what my wants and needs are. And I'm not special and unique. That's the way we all are. Yeah, I totally relate to that. Trauma. Yeah. You know, that's just the way we roll as human beings. And we have to work with that reality, no matter how much we don't want. So those are many of the reasons why, you know, partners should be in treatment and, and why should kids be in treatment? You know, again, Carl Jung, he said, one of the greatest gifts we can ever give our children is knowledge of our shadow self. I thought what that meant for the longest time was that we sat down with our kids one day and said, these, here's all the things you don't want to know about dad. Like, these are the things, and this is how the mistakes I made, so don't do that. Mm. That's not what it meant at all. It meant our knowledge of our own shadows, us getting to know those deep parts, dark parts of our own soul that we thought we would bury and take to our graves. We need to get to know those parts of ourselves, bring them closer and love them. And that ripples out to our children. That ripples out to the entire uh, system of our family mm -hmm. that we work with. And that's, that's really what recovery is about. And when we do that for ourselves, it also causes a change in, in the people that we love. And that change, especially for a partner who's been traumatized, will be even more frightening. And so they also need to come in to treatment to get familiar with that, to know that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate hearing about that. And, and, I can relate to having the honor of work with working with individuals and yet watching when the, when the partner is working along with the addict or when the family can come in for a session or the kids can come in with the mom or it's just exponentially just enhances everything. And it makes sense, right? If you have people and everybody's learning new ways of relating and healthy boundaries and it just grows and grows and ripples out, as you say. So it's, it's powerful. I, I wish, I wish everyone could bring everyone <laughs> into some kind of care or treatment or support group or something. But I know for a lot of partners, there's a sense of, I didn't cause this and I don't want to, I don't want to do all that, you know, and I respect that too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's, that's one thing with working with the addict, right? We try to help them understand is for the addict, they come to Sano Center, right? And they have a sense of relief, like, oh my gosh, I can finally be myself and share everything. Honestly, mm -hmm. right? For the partner, it's not that at all. They come to Sano Center and it's like, oh, this is a representation of the wound. Like, you know, the, the addict is, is at a point where they're in the gift, they're finding the gift in the wound. Mm -hmm. The partner's like, no, this is painful. Like, I hate Sono Center. I don't want anything to do with that therapy stuff, right? Yeah. And, you know, and we have to respect that for the partner in that process. Yeah. yeah. Honor that. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I just had an image. I'm thinking about the dis the formal disclosures that we facilitate, and I just I had an image of, um, you know, f almost like the the weight of the information is like a plane crashing, um, and and what we try to do in the formal disclosure is just slow down the crash and kind of try to let it hit the ground a little bit more gently. I mean, we can't stop the crash, we can't stop the trauma and all the truth. Um, 
but we can try to you know support and kind of get everybody out of the zone where it's going to land and get get all the medics you know around the crash site and and you know just really as best we can try to nurture the disclosure that is is very um upsetting and incredibly stressful typically um but but maybe not another trauma um because of the support around the family absolutely and i think you know that that actually brings to my mind about um oftentimes either partners in their in their 12-step programs or addicts in their 12-step programs will come in and say you know they tell me not to do disclosure that that i shouldn't do disclosure and it's like, you know what? Yes, in the 12 step program, that's right, because they're not professionally trained medical providers who are certified in sex addiction therapists. Mm -hmm. So you're right, in a peer to peer support organization, you shouldn't do disclosure, right? Because they're not the medics, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the therapists are. Mm -hmm. And and so that's when it is, is when you're when you're in treatment, when you're working with a certified sex addiction therapist, when you're working with people who you know, bring mindfulness based treatments and things like that into the room, that's when you want to do this closure. And it's necessary because if the other thing I used to work in, uh, in an emergency room when I was younger as an emergency department technician, and I was the guy who cleaned out the rooms, right? Ooh, uh -huh. So I would come into the room and I would tell the person with this big cut, like, I'm going to clean this wound out. This is what we're going to do. It's going to hurt. And they were they were all gun ho Yeah, yeah, we can do this. We can do this. And they would start to clean it out. And what would happen? Ah. And, right. They would start yelling. They would scream at me. They would beat <laughs> me. Right. All of this stuff. Right. Then they would tell me, oh, you're making it bleed more. All these things. Right. It's like, yes, all of that's what we need to do. So then afterwards, they calmed down. They were like, okay. Mental health is the exact same thing. You come into a therapist. You sit down, and we have to clean that wound out. And that's why in our informed consent, we try to tell people if it's worse, people right, it's better. better. Mm -hmm. And you know that's a hard, hard process. Mm -hmm. And it's even harder for a partner whose wound is so fresh and so new. Um, but it has to be done, and that's the the difficult part, right? Because if we're left to our own mind story, we'll say no, it doesn't have to be done. We need to ignore this. Yeah. But exact opposite is true yeah and so if there's any viewers that don't know what a formal disclosure is we could have a whole show on what that is but i'll summarize by saying it's basically a therapeutic a therapeutically guided account of the truth of the betrayals to the relationship and so that truth is so incredibly healing and you know picking out kind of clearing out the 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 dirt from the wound you know the minimizations and the blame shiftings and the you know the just getting down to the truth that this is what's happened not exaggerate not go into you know salacious details but just this is the truth of what happened so correcting the lies with the truth and and we can metabolize truth in our bodies we don't get infected by truth it might be really difficult or upsetting um but ultimately it's what brings healing and uh so that's yeah that's part of what we're doing as certified sex addiction therapists working with couples and families is trying to get them back on that track of of truthfulness and fidelity in their relationships regardless of how they define their relationships um so it's an honorable process and can be very very difficult as you say so i want to talk about your next book because you have the book there and then you have another one coming out. I, I don't want to end with this. I just am curious now because you mentioned the eight domains of recovery. And so I'm curious, what, what are those? What's, what's, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So my next book actually is not uh, about the eight domains of recovery. My next book actually oh. is called um, Awakening to the Addictive Mind. Ah. It's a story of and a guide to recovery. Okay. So that will be. Each chapter starts off with a personal uh, story mm -hmm. um, about my my addiction or something like that, and then moves into what the recovery lesson is, and then a mindfulness activity related to that lesson to help the person in recovery. So it's a workbook format. No, it's actually reading, and then they have mindfulness activities at, at the end of each. So it might be uh -huh. a meditative practice or things like that. So someone's story they'll read and then the recovery journey and then the exercise. 
Yeah, right. So they'll read this, the actual story of, of what brought the person to their point of awakening, right, mm -hmm. to, to their addiction, and then the uh, lesson or, or what that awakening was, right, what is gained from this, what's mm -hmm. the wisdom in this wound, right, mm -hmm. and then what's an activity that can help us cultivate a process of recovery that further accentuates that same wisdom in our own lives. Oh, it sounds so hopeful. Oh, that's, that's the idea, right? Because it is hopeful, right? Recovery is, that's the good news, <laughs> right? That's, that's like, you know, it's so funny when people will say, when they're meditating, right? They'll say, oh my gosh, you know, I caught myself thinking so much. And they, they want to beat themselves up. So no, that's the good news, <laughs> right? That's the good news. They don't get smacked with a cane. No, quit thinking, yeah, smack. Right? It's like, we woke up, right? Because um, that's what the mind does. It mm -hmm. thinks, it creates mm -hmm. hypotheses, right? And we want to see that. Because uh, only when we see it can we make a choice on which one we want to focus. And that's the meditation bringing it to focus. Because, I mean, right. you're, you are you are a huge proponent of meditation for treating sex addiction and that's that is incredibly effective and you've talked earlier about the you know the and i just have to say this again because i love this quote i have to rewind and watch it so i can write it down but um the fact that you're an addict is the key to your recovery like the way your brain works so how how is meditation a core part of that recovery transformation yeah so i mean i think you know, first of all, what I would try to explain to people is we are always meditating. It's just, what are we meditating on? Hmm. Right? Are we meditating on CNN? Right? Are we meditating on addiction? Are we medi on, meditating on ways to nurture and love ourselves? Right? And so what I mean by that is the mind is constantly making hypotheses. And we are constantly identifying with hypotheses, and then that's moving into behavior. So that is the process of meditation. Now what we want to do, though, is start to separate the space between the manifestation of the hypothesis and the awareness that the hypothesis has been created. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is through meditation. This and I don't space. know of another way to do it. Right, is expanding that space, right? So, you know, by by sitting, walking, lying, right, or eating in a mindful way, where we start to notice what the sensations are that are arising as we do that process. So, in the formal kind of traditional sitting meditation, what do you do? You notice your breath. You notice what it feels like. You notice. As you exhale, what what happens in the body? Right? Now, inevitably, what will happen is you'll do that for a tenth of a millisecond, and then you'll start thinking about everything that you got to do for the day. And that's okay. That's what we do. The good news is when we realize that we're doing that, and then we come back to breath. And each time we do that, the space between us going back into thought and us being able to be focused on what is here, mm -hmm. that will increase over time. And that is a small part, right, of the recovery process. Because think about addiction. What are you trying to do? You're trying to stop yourself from impulsively behaving in a certain way. So the more space you have between thought and then behavior and where you presently are, what you're presently experiencing, the greater likelihood there is that you will not act out again. Right? And so it's that that's the process, right? That's that's what we do, and we just practice that process in a guided manner over and over again. And inevitably what happens is those uncomfortable parts of ourselves that we have tried to suppress start to come to the awareness of our minds. Those parts of ourselves that have been traumatized, those emotions that we feel, mm -hmm. they start to surface. And that's what makes meditation so hard. And that's really the core to intimacy, right? Is being present with the parts of ourselves and the parts of other people that we might find distressing and being able to say, hey, as Brene Brown says, me too, right? And being able to be present with that person. But we can only be present with another if we're present with ourselves, right? 
And I, I could see where not only is that so beneficial, I'm going to check the volume here. Someone, one of our live watchers said the volume was low, so I want to be sure we can hear you as much as possible. Um, okay. I can try to speak a little louder too. Okay. Um, look, um, what I, what I, what I see is that not only does that help the individual with how they, they talk with themselves, how they let themselves respond or, you know, how they have suddenly kind of have the, the mind muscle to intervene and go, whoa, 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 okay, I got to redirect. I'm not going to go into that fantasy or I'm not going to go into that obsession. I got to redirect and have right. more and more power to do that, but also with other people in relations with others when others are reacting or others are having, you know, feelings that might feel intolerable um, or that, that, that it's kind of a, a, a double benefit for how to care for the self and how to how to be in intimacy and deal with just the, the complexity that is there. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I should preface too, when I reference Buddhism, I reference it from a psych Buddhist psychology perspective. I don't, I personally don't look at Buddhism as a necessarily a religion. I look at it as, you know, the, in fact, the Buddha was asked, um, are you a God? He said, no, I'm just a man who's figured some stuff out. Try it out. If you like it, great. If you don't, don't do it. Mm -hmm. you know and since then of course other things have been manifest for it, but i look at it from an academic perspective um, and you know there's something in in i'm going to get kind of a little academic here but there's something in sanskrit it's called the bodhisattva and bodhi is heart Safa is a warrior and the bodhisattva in um buddhist folklore buddhist tradition is the calm in the storm and what does that mean? That doesn't mean that they don't feel. It means that they're present and attuned to what they feel. They're able to sit with that distress. And when the storm, the tempest of other people's emotions comes through the room and, and is tormenting people, they're able to be that calming nature, that calming presence to say, I'm here, what do you need, right? And I often use the comparison to an emergency room doctor when I when I'm working with my uh, with other therapists and I talk to them right because many therapists they come in and they're like okay let's get to work and they have all of this energy right and they're they're like ready and they want to do this which is beautiful and yet for a client it can be like especially a client who's been traumatized or in trauma it can just right and so I ask them I, I use a thought experiment and I ask them if you went into an emergency room and you had a pole through your neck which doctor would you rather have? The doctor who goes, oh my gosh, you have a pole in your neck. What are we gonna do? Oh, right? Or, right? You know, we can, we're gonna take care of this, don't you worry, right? And all of this, right? Would you rather have that doctor or would you rather have the doctor who came in the room and said, you know, okay, Mr. Smith, I can see that you have a pole in your neck. It's okay, we're gonna work through this. I'm going to step out, I'm going to assemble my team, we're going to come back in, and we're going to get you stabilized and get this handled. Of course you would want the second one, right? Yeah, and with working with new therapists, that's what I try to explain to them when, you know, it's not that they want to suppress their feelings, but they need to be in a mindful state, a calm, connected state with themselves. It's not okay to come rushing into the room from a busy, hectic day and having all this chaos and then sit down and tell your client, okay, I'm ready for this. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be present for our clients. We need to be grounded. We need to have practiced our own recovery process, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. you know, a meditative grounded process, right? We shouldn't be taking half hour lunches. We should be taking a minimum of an hour lunch, right? We should have incorporated into our day as therapists, you know, um, breaks and meditative times, right? We shouldn't be seeing eight clients a day. That's not what a therapist should do. It's not, it's not human, right? And that is part of the treatment of the client too, is nurturing and caring for ourselves. I wholeheartedly agree. I've been studying the tools of Workaholics Anonymous, and yeah. I mean, they're amazing about underscheduling and don't put something new until you take something else out and schedule your breaks and don't multitask. And, you know, I mean, it's like that, that sobriety as, as people who want to be helpful to others um, right. is, is, is part of the treatment. It's not separate. Um, right. 
and it models the self-care that the client needs to learn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so there's so many more things I want to talk to you about. We have a little over 10 minutes, so I got to pick and choose. But um, I, want to, I want to come back to the sex addiction in the news piece a little bit because two things. So when I first started this show, it was about news stories. And so I did a presentation, and one category every week was LGBTQ news, sex addiction in the news, LGBTQ focus. And I had the hardest time finding any news. Um, and I, I, toward the end of when I was running the show that way, there was a great story about the impact of Grindr on gay men. Um, so it was a, but just a little bit of public press, hardly any. And so we touched on this a little bit before the show about how the ICD-11, International Classification of Diseases Manual, is proposed, probably going to come through and implemented the medical diagnosis of compulsive sexual behavior disorder. So that is now getting international press. We're talking mainstream news. And it's, it's highlighting, because I do some advocacy and education about this, that there is this polarization. And one of the main branches of the pushback against anything called sex addiction uh, comes from the gay community and particularly the gay treatment community. Um, and, and I mean gay men. I, I, I'm not familiar with, with lesbian women or bisexual providers who are out there. Um, so that's been my experience and even having some difficult conversations where the, the concept of sex addiction from the perspective of those providers is just terrible and awful. And so you are a gay man who runs three centers treating intimacy disorders and et cetera, but you are not balking at the term sex addiction. So how are you different and how can we build bridges from these fantastic therapists out there who are, who are feeling marginalized by the diagnosis? How, how did you, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing that I would say is the gay community, right? In the past, it was part of that uh, disease diagnosis. Yeah. Gay men and women were labeled as disease, uh, diseased. Yeah. And so I think we want to keep that in mind when we're thinking about the gay community and them um, hearing about anything related to sex and sexuality being something that could be back in the, to that diseased category. Yeah, that makes yeah. And so I think, you know, the, the visceral response is to immediately squash that. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I think we want to just kind of chalk that up. Right. And then the next thing is we want to remember that outside of the disease model for the gay community, um, things like religion and these types of ideologies were also used and are used still today to squash homosexuality, right? And uh, so with that, that visceral response that the gay community has, we want to just notate that, right? Right, and so we want to, like unethical reparative therapies, su such church groups that say, you know, which, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah which still goes on to yeah, today, I mean, right? It's illegal and, in Washington state, but there's places it's not yet and people are right. still, yeah. Right. And so we want to keep, we want to remember that all of that's kind of in the soup, right? And so the gay community, I think that we, and I don't, I can't speak for all of the gay community, but just from my experience, the things that, that come to my mind is I worry about that slippery slope, right? Okay, if they say he's having too much sex which isn't sex addiction, but I can just see like this idea of too much sex is bad and that's going to be diagnosable. Then, you know, when, it, when are they going to, what's next? Pretty soon it'll be generalized again and, and or, or misapplied to people who are gay if they're having more sex than some person thinks is the right amount or something. Right. Yeah. And the truth is, you know, I've, I've heard this too. I should just say, I've heard, oh yeah, you know, gay men have all the sex and, and I mean, 
the gay, the gay community isn't having any more or less sex than the straight community. Let's just, you know, be honest. There are people out there in the straight community that are having sex all the time, just like the gay community. I mean, it's just, there's a variety of people, right? And some of it is, is addictive in nature. Some of it's not, and that's okay. And addiction, you know, in, from my perspective, and I think this is one way we can start to, to build that bridge. It's not about how much sex or how many sex partners you've had. It's not about that, right? There are four things that I look at when I think about sex addiction. I think about safety, right? Or any addiction. I think about the person's safety. Are there, is there safety at risk when they're participating in the behavior? Is their freedom at risk, right? Are there relationships at risk? Is their work at risk? And then the other thing I look at is, are they continuing the behavior despite having destructive or consequences in their life? And those are the things that I look at, right? And I move away from also the disease model. And I think that's the other thing that we can start to, is it a disease? Yes. Can we use MRI machines? And is there a great study being done right now by, by uh, Dr. Carnes in, in, in Canada, and, and yes, there is, right? And so I don't want to, I, I don't want to like push the, the, the academics away, but that doesn't serve us for, uh, uh, you know, the, the academic serves us for research and it serves us for, for um, articulating a conceptual approach, but when we're relating to and interacting with our clients, it's not, you know, it's like if you have diabetes, you don't need to know all the ins and outs of the diabetes. You need to know what I, what do I need to do to help myself, mm -hmm. right? And so that, you know, I think that's, that's an approach we can make. And then the last part that I would honestly say is I think at the beginning of, of the sex addiction movement, right, the, the idea of training and stuff, it was – at the very beginning, it was, it was, there was a bit of a bias. It's not there anymore. It's really not, but there was a bit of a bias of like this conservative, you know, kind of, uh, nature. And that created this polar reaction from the sex therapy treatment community. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, that inter that overlays with the, with this idea of building bridges between the gay and straight community in relation to sex addiction and all of these things, because that created this kind of feud between these two camps. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we have a lot to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. I don't think siloing ourselves mm -hmm. and saying this one's right or this one's right. I don't think it's about right or wrong. I think it's about finding the, the kernels of wisdom that are supported uh, you know, by data that can help us move together because at the end of the day, we're all treatment professionals and we all want the same thing to help alleviate suffering, right? And so I think if we focus on the outcome, what we want for people, and then we have a good, healthy conversation with each other, you know, and then the last thing, of course, is that diversity piece, right? If you are a therapist working with somebody who is a gay man or, or, or gay woman, lesbian woman, and you think that they might be struggling with a compulsive sexual relationship or sexual behaviors, is to sit down and say, hey, I don't know about your community. I don't, I'm, you know, if you're straight, right? I'm straight, I don't know. So I'm going to throw these ideas out there and I want to see what your thoughts are and you can correct me. Because at the end of the day, even though, you know, and, and Patrick, Dr. Karn said to me, when we, when my first, one of my first trains, he said, one of two people uh, better be in control in the room and it had best be you, but being in control of the room is letting yourself be informed by the client mm -hmm. and acknowledging that even though you may be in control, they are the expert, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I love and that turning humility. to them for that, mm -hmm. for that wisdom. Yeah. Not trying to know it all. Yeah. That's always a great reminder. So Thank you. I, the, you know, we've covered a lot of ground and I have this desire also to take just a snippet of that video and title it, you know, building bridges because you've given such a core explanation to help deepen compassion for myself and others about no wonder there's this reaction. No wonder there's this, because I feel like in some ways I'm being told my experience doesn't exist. 
And, and I'm sure that's how other people feel. <laughs> They're being told their experience doesn't exist. And no one really likes that, do we? It's just the kind of the essence of invalidation. But when you layer on the history of oppression and how these kinds of labels have been misused and the organizational conservatism that has led to judgment and you know felt like the same old oppression and the possible alignment, whether it's fair or not, not these days. I don't think it's, it's not fair, but it, maybe in the past, with conversion therapies and I mean, all of that uh, is no wonder there's these divides. So um, it's so valuable to get your perspective and I thank you and I'm grateful for you for, and for Rob Weiss and some of the other leaders in our, in the sex addiction treatment community who are openly gay and saying, hey, these two things can coexist and help is possible and let's, you know, let's build bridges, but not, you know, not worry too much about, um, yeah, the, the divisiveness and just get to treating people. Right, right, you know, and, and I think disagreement and debate is healthy, but we have to look at it in a contextual way, right? That's great, yeah. thank you. Those contextual variables. One of many gifts I'm receiving tonight. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> and I know others are receiving too and will be in the future because we'll put this video up on YouTube. So, um, Let's see, I have to ask you this before we go. It's my second to last question. Um, do, do you have advice? So you not only run two, three treatment centers, um, but you also run a press, Sano Press? Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I run Sano Center for Recovery with mm -hmm. Christy Cosper and, and we, um, you know, that's kind of growing like gangbusters. We have three uh, brick and mortar centers and then we also do online uh, coaching services. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also are have recently, just at the beginning of this year, um, opened a publishing house. It's called Sono Press and it's really, it's twofold. It's a publishing house for people who um, for therapists who you know are, are who have stories of resilience of recovery of of you know and and have want to get that out it's also supportive services so if a therapist wants to write a book they've always dreamt of writing a book but they don't know how to approach it um, we can offer services to help with that process so it's you know the the old way of publishing used to be that you kind of had you know random house and you had this this big publishing entity and you know you went to that publishing entity and ooh, they you know had all of the power and control that's not publishing anymore mm -hmm. Publisher, you know, publishing can be done self-publishing. It can be done very easy. So why, why do I want to go with that publishing house? Well, because we walk you through the process, right, from concept to shelf, mm -hmm. and uh, we can help you with that, and we can help go through that process with you. And it doesn't mean you have to go through that process with us. If you wanted to, if you already had a book and you wanted to write, or you wanted to publish it and submit it, you can do that too. That kind of old traditional way. If you uh, just wanted to have some supportive, right, work and have um, one of our narrative therapists or one of our, uh, I mean, one of uh, a narrative uh, um, editor, or if you wanted a proofread editor, or if you wanted guidance on how to do certain things, how to get a copyright, how to do these things, we can help you with those things too, right? Um, so you don't have to publish with us to get, you know, your ISBN number or something like that, or to have your, your, uh, your book designed or the layout done. We can do those aspects too, but we put it all together for you so that you can do it all or you can do part of it. Um, and I think a couple of things that I would say to therapists, because, you know, I have come across, I don't think I've ever met a therapist that doesn't want to write a book. I know, like me it, too. Say, <laughs> right? Yeah. But they, they just can't get it out, right? It's so, it's like, gosh, I have a book. Mm -hmm. I have it right here, but I don't know how to get it out, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to help people. And so, yeah, actually, this is, comes from Rob Weiss. He, he said this once, and I, I think it's very much true. If you can write a blog, you can write a book. You know, so write, you know, five, 10, 15 blogs, and there's your book. It's done, right? Um, and, you know, and the other tip of it, or a bit of advice I'd give you is the best book is a finished book. But don't talk about writing it. Just sit down and start writing. Just do it. 
Yes, you know, and at the end of the day, it's the it's the proofreading editor, it's the narrative editor's job to clean it up. Yeah, you know, so just get it onto the paper, and then we'll figure all the rest out. You know. That is fantastic. And that's such a great message for therapists who have that book in them and they're terrified of how to do it. You know, you think from A to Z and what you're saying is no, your job's to write. If you want to come with us, we're, we can help you with everything else. We can't write the book for you, but we can do everything else. So that's great. That's a, an amazing service. And to me, grounded in ethical, knowledgeable care particularly anyone writing about addiction or maybe a self-help memoir or, you know, I mean, it's how ideal to have a publisher that truly gets that. I, I just, I, yeah, good to know. Good to know. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's like the thing, right. For me anyways, is I can't do, I couldn't do Sano center for recovery. If I wasn't in recovery, I couldn't do Sano press unless I had realized that these were the struggles I had. It's like, I saw this struggle and I saw all these therapists. And I was like, you know, there's the problem. Let's, let's find a way to overcome it, you know, and let's approach uh, publication in a fresh way because the old way is, is, uh, is over. Yeah. I mean, the old publishing houses are, are, you know, unless they adapt, it's not going to be that way anymore. I, don't, I just don't see the future in having that. So. I agree with you. Well, how can people find your books? How can they find you? Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, of course, they can they can find me at sonorecovery.com or Darren at sonorecovery.com. Uh, also, sonopress.com is where uh, our books are. You can also find them on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. They're available in Europe and the U.S., um, you know. So, yeah. Nice. So you and, can get books into brick-and-mortar stores? Uh, we are in the process of working on that with the way that we have it with Barnes and Noble is there uh, right now they're not actually shelf space okay but when you go into Barnes and Noble if you want the book they can they order it then for you they you get know. it for you yeah gotcha. okay so but, or you can just go to barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com or sonopress.com you know and it's all did so in those ways it is it is still digital distribution okay. uh, but we are working in, and we are in the process of the Getting it on the shelf, that's a whole nother kit and caboodle that's being worked on. Like I said, we just started this year, so we're in that process. Cool. All right. Well, I guess we are about out of time. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your passion and your story, some of your own story, your hard-won wisdom. Uh, your your mindfulness and serenity and compassion comes out just listening to you talk. So oh, it's not yeah. a theory, and I've said this several times, but it's just relaxing and cool to hang out with you. Oh, thank uh, you. So I hope we get to sit next to each other at Symposium again or something. Um, but I really appreciate your heart for the addict. You're a, a natural educator, uh, and that's a lot of a lot of you know we deal with very smart people. <laughs> Thanks you know, a very, really a very right. famous 12, yeah, a very famous 12 step saying is I've never met anybody too stupid to get this program, but I sure have met a lot of people too smart. Too smart yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can be a detriment. And so that's, yeah. you know, just, just education that's not shaming, um, just to help people have a sense of there is a way out. Um, again, that quote, your addiction is proof that you can recover or something. Yeah. You know, I mean, it just, that is so encouraging just from the very start. Um, and so thank you again for your precious time tonight and thank you know. so much. Yeah. Okay. And so to our viewers on Facebook, um, I want to announce that I am going to be winding up this show. So I have just two more interviews until we are going to stop. I'm going to take August off and I'm working on some new projects, training therapists about how to treat female sex and love addicts with a, a lens of the female informed care. And it's been really cool. I've been interviewing um, my colleagues. I've interviewed 24 colleagues, um, just trying to find out what did they do that's working. And so it's an exciting project, but it's going to take me off the air here. So this is a particularly special interview because it's just one of three more left. Um, 
and um, but this video will be placed on YouTube for ever uh, so you can access it later if you want please share it with friends and feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel because there will be more things coming uh, over time but if you want to stay in touch with me you're welcome to sign up for my newsletter you can just go on my website stacysprott.com and keep in touch that way so thanks again to Darren Ford and thanks for your um, yeah, just your bright presence, and I wish you all the best. And for our viewers, I'll say um, have a great weekend. Oh, I forgot to say I have a family member who has a birthday today, so I want to say happy birthday to my family member. I'm going to leave it a mystery, but I love you, and I hope that you're well, and I miss you. Um, and uh, I'll just close how I always do, which is to our viewers, may you feel loved, may you feel cherished, and may you love and cherish others.